Good morning. I'm Ken Bolin, and I'm one of the elders at Redeemer by the Sea. I want to welcome you and let you know we're glad you're here with us today. It is our prayer that you will encounter God through our worship together. I'd like to direct your attention to a few things available during our online worship service. First, we'd love to get a connection card from you. If you're watching through our rbts.online.church site, you'll see a link for connection card above. So please take a moment and fill that out. That connection card, let us know that you're here. There is a link for a downloadable sermon handout that you can print if you'd like to take notes. And there's a link to make an offering if you choose. For children, click on our kids link, view our online Sunday school with Miss Rhonda and some of our wonderful Sunday school teachers. It has songs, Bible stories, and downloadable puzzles and worksheets. If you want to know more about our ministry, check out our website at redeemerbythesea.org or find us on social media. As we continue to social distance, we want you to know that we're here for you. If I or any of our elders or staff can be of assistance, please don't hesitate to ask. Now, I invite you to join me as together we prepare for worship by reading from Psalm 148 responsibly. The words are on the screen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens.
Good morning, church. We're still in the wonderful season of Easter. And in our area, it's coinciding with the beautiful season of spring with warm temperatures and flowers popping up. In fact, last week we heard Jesus tell us to look at the flowers of the field. But what can we learn by doing that? Well, for one thing, we can learn not to worry. But really, what is the place of worry in the life of the Christian? I think we get a good perspective on that from our Easter readings from a couple of weeks ago when the women left the tomb. And Matthew's Gospel tells us that they left with fear and great joy. But notice that it's great joy, not great fear. And I think that is to be the life of the Christian, right? That our joy overshadows our fear. So we're going to be continuing our message series today called Why Worry? And we're going to learn particularly that worry is a choice. Quite frankly, we have the choice every day whether to worry or whether to trust in God. And so I'm glad you're here today, and I pray that Easter's hope overshadows whatever fear or worry is happening in your life right now. So let's begin in the name of the one who casts out all fear, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us also prepare our hearts for worship today by confessing our sins to God and asking His forgiveness. Almighty God, through Jesus, our Lord, we have forgiveness and life, yet we often refuse to live as your redeemed people. We sin against you in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. We follow our own sinful desires instead of living according to your word. Lord, we look at the boldness of your disciples in the face of the dangers and threats that they faced following your resurrection. The risks were very real, and yet they didn't let that stop them. They were determined to proclaim your name. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have shrunk back in fear and worry and have failed to put our hope and our trust in you. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Forgive our doubt. Forgive our carelessness. Forgive our self-centered attitudes. And lift us up once again so that we might stand in the victory of Easter. Friends, the Lord has heard the confession of your heart and he forgives all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, it is my joy to share with you that by Christ's death on the cross, your sins are put to death. And that includes all your sins. Sins of doubt, sins of fear, sins of selfishness, sins of worry. And it's also my joy to tell you that when Christ was raised from the dead, you also were raised up with him. And in that resurrection, you are given new life. And that new life goes on forever and ever but it begins today. That means that no longer do the sins of your past remain with you, your failures and your shortcomings, and even the guilt and the shame related to them are gone. Christ's victory is your victory. And because of him, you are forgiven all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is in the joy and the knowledge that Jesus has overcome death and open the gate of everlasting life to us, that we now eagerly prepare our hearts to hear his word. Our first scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. 
Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Living with uncertainty can take its toll. The normal day-to-day is replaced with fear, worry, doubt. When our normal is disrupted, our surroundings begin to feel weak. Foundations begin to rattle. Our lives become disoriented. As time goes on, we begin to lose sight of the one constant on our journey. Jesus. The fear is consuming, 
The worry, draining. The doubt, painful. Even in our darkest moments, when the last thread of hope has unraveled from our being, we must dwell on truth. We must remember, no matter what is happening around us, God is still sovereign. Today, let us dwell on the truth of Easter. The stone has been rolled away. The grave has been rendered powerless. Death has transformed to life. In our fear, He is still risen. In our worry, He is still victorious. In our doubt, He is still alive. When everything seems hopeless, the hope of Easter remains. Good morning. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everybody worries. It's something universal. We all do it. It's been around forever. Jesus even addressed this in his Sermon on the Mount. So it's encouraging that it's not just you and it's not just me and it's not just Americans. It's everybody. And one way you can look at worry is that it's essentially a preoccupation about tomorrow, or more correctly, a preoccupation with wanting to control tomorrow or to take away the uncertainty about tomorrow. We don't like uncertainty. But as I mentioned last time, if you think about it and carefully examine things, you realize that you've never been able to control any point in your life or any area of your life, right? You might say, well, when I go to the restaurant and I order something, I'm controlling that. But what about now? Can you go to any restaurant you want and order anything you like? No. I would submit that even what you thought was control was just the illusion of control. And I think now more than any time in our history, we're keenly aware of just how much is outside of our control. Someone once said that worrying is like prayer in reverse. Here's what that means. See, prayer generally makes issues seem smaller to us and relieves our stress. Worry, on the other hand, puts our attention and devotion on things, and that makes the issue bigger and increases stress. So worry is like prayer in reverse. But see, you and I can turn that around. We can pray more and worry less. As a matter of fact, that topic came up during our Wednesday morning prayer meeting, and uh, Dr. Melanie Burkholder, who is a Christian counselor in our congregation, she was at that meeting, and she shared with us that she had a, a saying about prayer and worry when she was growing up. And so I like what she said, so I asked her if she could take a minute and record herself talking about that and then send that to us so that I could share that with you today. And so here's that video from Melanie. Let's watch. Greetings, Redeemer family. This is Melanie here. Just wanted to reach out. I just got off the uh, Zoom call with Pastor and some other folks in a prayer group, and we were sharing about what gets us through this uh, really challenging time that we're facing. And one of the things that I shared was that uh, faith and worry can't live in the same household. And uh, recently, a girlfriend of mine gave me this sign that's in my office that says, pray more, worry less. So I want to encourage you guys to find yourselves uh, when you're struggling to just do just that. Pray more and worry less. I firmly believe in the power of prayer and how it can transform our lives. And um, a special, a special prayer for all of you who are isolated and feeling alone during this time. And um, just keep the faith. And uh, thanks. Have a great day. And doesn't that seem just really timely and relevant for what we're talking about right now? Thanks, Melanie. And you know what else is really timely and relevant for what we're talking about today? Coronavirus memes. They just seem to express our common emotions and our worries. Like this one. Am I the only one who gets panicked when you see the last bag of Cheetos in the pantry? Quarantine snacks. It's a big cause for worry. And in some cases, we are worrying about different things than before. For example, you used to worry if your dog ate the cushions on the couch. Now, cushions are no big deal. But chewing up the toilet paper, 
anything but that. And we used to worry about which way the toilet paper hung off the roll. But nobody argues about that now, right? Now we have our priorities straight. And we used to worry about getting viruses on our computer, Nuff said. See, opportunities to worry are all around us, and they're ever increasing these days. So we're going to pick up today, listening to Jesus talk about worry in his Sermon on the Mount. Uh, last week, we heard Jesus address this topic. And even though the worries of the people of Jesus stay, um, the, the ones that he was talking to in that time period were different than our worries today, the concept's the same. And Jesus' words are very applicable. And so what's really good about how Jesus talks about this subject is that he doesn't just give you self-help tips or ways to cope with your worry. No, Jesus says there's actually a solution for this. And this just sets Jesus apart from everybody else. I'm not saying that those other resources on worry that you can find in the bookstore or on the internet, that they can't be helpful. But what I'm saying is that what Jesus has to say about worry, it's, it's next level. He actually offers us a way to eliminate worry altogether. And Jesus knows. He knows about us. He created us. He knows the way we work. And he knows what doesn't work for us. So we should pay attention when Jesus teaches on a subject, right? So I want to pick up where we left off last week. But first, I'd like to give you three quick points that kind of, um, you know, summarize what we talked about last time, okay? So the first one is this. Jesus said, you can't add anything to your life by worrying. Well, he actually asked it in the form of a rhetorical question. He said, who of you, by worrying, can add an hour to your life? And we all agreed, none of us can. You can't control the future by worry, and you can't add anything to your life by worrying. So to paraphrase Jesus, worrying is a waste of time. Another takeaway is this. Not worrying is not the same as not caring. I mean, if you look at the life of Jesus, you won't see him advocating irresponsibility. He never says anything like, it's all gonna work out, so who cares? No, in fact, Jesus teaches the opposite. He teaches us to do unto others. He teaches us to go the extra mile. He teaches the parable of the talents where we are to work with what we're given and to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. The Christian understanding about work is that in our work, we're always conduits of what God's providing. So there's just no worry there. There's only a reliance on God. So you and I work, and we care. We just don't worry. And the last point that we touched on, and, I, and we're going to really, I think, extend on this topic today, is the idea that Jesus taught that the things that you are most devoted to are the things that you worry about the most. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And he said, you cannot be devoted to stuff or to mammon and be devoted to God at the same time. But again, I love this. Jesus doesn't just point out the problem. He shows us the solution. He teaches us that if we can redirect our devotion, then we can eliminate the need to worry about the future. And that's where we're going to pick up today. So let's start in verse 27. Jesus says, can any one of you, by worrying, at a single hour to your life. Remember we said, no, it's actually more likely that by worrying we've probably taken an hour off of our life. Verse 28, he says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. And remember, Jesus also told us to look at the birds of the air. Uh, not only is it a nice break from our stress to stop and look at nature, but Jesus is giving us an object lesson that's all around us, that shows us and teaches us how God provides. So if you find yourself worrying and wondering about God's goodness, just look up and you'll see a bird in the sky, or look around and you'll see a flower in the field, especially this time of year. And so Jesus goes on to say about those flowers, he says in verse 29, Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? It's really a simple question. If you believe that God has created and is sustaining all things without our work or worry, and those things aren't nearly as valuable to him as you are, then why would you worry? 
See, Jesus then points out what this is all about. He says this. He says it's a matter of faith. He says, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So you can make the case that there is a relationship between the size of your faith and the size of your worry. If your worries are so big, it could be because your faith is so little. In fact, there's something very interesting to note about the Greek word that is behind this expression of you of little faith. Remember that the New Testament is written in Greek, and in this case, Jesus uses an expression that only he uses in the New Testament. It's not even found anywhere else in ancient Greek. It's like Jesus made it up to describe a specific thing. And what he did is he combined two smaller Greek words into a compound word. The first part of that word means little or few. The second part means faith. And so the way the language works, it comes together something like this. Oh, you little faithers, you. In other words, you who believe little. Kind of that sort of thing. The basic idea is it's not a compliment. Jesus is kind of saying that the reason you're so worried is because your faith is so little. And so if you want to worry less, believe more, trust more. Because the bottom line is you don't stop worrying by trying harder to stop worry any more than you force yourself to go to sleep by trying harder to go to sleep. See, Jesus says this is all a faith problem. And one way to increase your faith is to look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. Look at God's beautiful world and remind yourself who created all this. And that will increase your faith and decrease your worry. So in verse 31, he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Now, remember, those are the worry points of his generation. But for most of us today, these aren't our worry points. We're worried about other things. I think if Jesus were speaking us to today, today, he might say, so don't worry saying, how's life going to be after the pandemic? Will our economy reco recover? Will I get my job back? Will my kids be able to get a job? Jesus is saying, don't stress over these things and listen carefully. It's not because they're not important. It's not that you should be careless and not care. That's not his point. He's saying, don't worry about the future because, and here comes something that his audience didn't like then and we don't like to hear today, but he says, here's who does that. Here's who worries about the future and about these things. He says in verse 32, for the pagans run after these things. That's run after. That's another way of saying what they're devoted to. The pagans run after all these things. Now, pagans are people that don't even believe in God. They don't believe that God created anything. They don't believe that God cares. They don't believe he even exists. And Jesus says they are the ones to spend all their time worrying and running after the things of this world. So how do you think that comparison made his listeners feel? How does it make you feel? I'll tell you what I think Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to get us to ask the question, does the amount that I worry reflect my faith? Or said another way, Am I worrying any less than a person who has no faith? It's a challenging but important question to ask. And it's not to make you feel guilty. It's to help you see how closely related faith and worry are. Because we're at a time in our country right now where there is more to worry about than there has been in a really long time. But see, the difference between you and the pagans isn't the challenge. See, the challenge right now is the same for everybody. The difference is in your response to the challenge. Does your response reflect a faith in God, in a God who provides? And is your lack of worry a witness to the fact that you are trusting in God? So let's look at how Jesus finishes out this section of his Sermon on the Mount. Verse 32, he says this. He says, And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. It's a statement. But what it does is it poses the question in the mind of the listener. It forces us to ask the question, do I believe that? Do I believe that my Heavenly Father knows that I need them? See, Jesus has already raised the issue of faith two times. He said, oh, you of little faith. And then he talks about the pagans who have no faith, what they believe and run after. 
So that's how you know that this is still part of the faith question. But if you believe your Heavenly Father knows something, then should you be worrying about that? Here, look at it this way. Imagine this. Imagine if when you prayed for something, you got an answer back from God's secretary, or let's just say an angel. And the angel didn't tell you what God was going to do, but he simply said when you prayed, God knows. Then wouldn't that mean that you shouldn't worry about it? See, if you and I know that God is aware, then that's all we need to know to stop worrying, right? Because worry is related to your faith. And worry tells you what you're devoted to, what you run after. And so what Jesus says next ties this all together. From the very beginning when he said you can't serve both God and things, and when he says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's taught us that the issue is our devotion, who we serve, and what gets our attention. And the solution to worry, he says, is not to, to try to stop worrying, but to redirect our devotion. And so instead of directing our devotion on the things that the pagans or the little faithers direct their devotion toward, he says this, but seek first. And that but tells us that Jesus is implying that this is a change of heart for us. And he says, seek first, because what you seek first is where your devotion is. It's what you run after or what you're devoted to. And what you've been seeking first and what you've been devoted to is the wrong thing. So it leads you to worry. But Jesus says, I'm going to give you the solution. And the solution is to, to, to transfer your devotion. And where does Jesus say that we should put our devotion? What we should seek first? He says in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, redirect your devotion towards God's kingdom. Because as long as the food, the clothing, and the shelter, or your work, or your home, or your kids, or the economy, or the virus, or the pandemic, as long as those things are first in your mind, you're going to worry. But friends, Jesus invites us to a different life. One that's not filled with worry, but is filled with faith. And he gives us an opportunity to surrender our life, including our worries, to him. And how do we do it? We do it by seeking first his kingdom. And you might say, but what's that look like? Well, it's actually something that we know well, and we actually pray every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. We say this, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth, as in it is in heaven. That means that we're seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness on earth. You can think of that to mean in your life, in every part of your life on earth. So instead of praying like we often do, we, we kind of pray something like this, God, here are my worries. Now what are you going to do about them? If we accept Jesus' challenge to seek first God's kingdom, then our prayers start to sound something like this. God, Show me your kingdom and help me do something about it. And then something happens when we recognize that it's his kingdom and it's his righteousness, then we become worried less about it because we know that it's all about him. It's in his hands. And friends, when you finally make that transfer of your devotion, you put it in his hands, something happens to your worry. You may have experienced this before. I know I have, and I've seen it in others. We get to that point in our life where we finally turn it over to God. And sometimes it takes brokenness to make it happen. It takes getting to that point in our life where everything is so stripped away that we have nothing left. We finally turn to God and we say, I surrender to you, God. Whatever I have left, it's yours. Maybe you've been here before. But what you find is that when you do that, Suddenly there's a peace. It's a peace that the Bible says surpasses all human understanding. And what that means is it doesn't make human sense because if you look at it, nothing's changed except your perspective. Nothing's changed and now you have peace. You, you may have been freaked out because you don't know what the future holds. But now you have peace because you know who holds the future. And so he says, look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. And know that I know what you're going through. 
I care about you, and I've got this. Friends, this may be a turning point for you. If you've been experiencing worry, worry or uh, you're just a little too burdened by the things of this world, uh, there's an opportunity for you to simply surrender to God. You might want to actually do this right now and put your hands up, like palms up. This is a simple way to, to demonstrate that you're releasing control, right? You're not grabbing on. And so you can say in your heart or you can say this out loud. Just say, God, I'm surrendering everything to you. Regardless of what I think, what, what I think I need, I'm simply praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's all about your kingdom, God. And it's all about your will for my life, my family, and this world. I'm trusting you for tomorrow, God. Would you do that? Because in that action, what you're doing is you're transferring your devotion from this world to God's kingdom. You're moving from worry to faith. And it's so good for you to do that. And Jesus knows this. Jesus knows that's what he wants for his people because he knows that the pagans will never figure it out. But you're different because you know him. And his kingdom has been revealed to you. And you've been given the opportunity not to run after the things of this world, but to follow him with your life. And friends, it's better. What he's saying will transform you because you move from worry to faith. And here's something else I'll tell you. It's become increasingly clear to me in recent days. I've, I've been in ministry for more than 20 years. And time and time again, I've heard myself tell people that they can't control the future. Uh, that, that, that things could change in a minute. I'll tell them, don't put your trust in, in the stock market or all your wealth. It could go away in a minute. But in the back of my mind, I think I still believe that to some degree, we could control our future. And, and our outcomes are basically dependent on our actions. But friends, I'm standing here with you today, and I think we have a life-size object lesson that has taught us that we absolutely cannot control our futures. We do not know what tomorrow will hold. Regardless of what is in our day timer, regardless of whatever plans we have, it can change in a moment's notice. And that's something that could cause us to be terrified, or it's something that could make us cling even tighter to God, who does control the future. So friends, I see this as an opportunity for you and me to increase our faith, to realize with a clarity like we've never had before, just how dependent we are on God for everything we have. So that means that you and I can seek first his kingdom and his righteousness because that's what it's all about. And when Jesus tells us to do that, he's not just giving us an empty command. That command to seek first his kingdom, it comes with the promise. promise. Jesus tells us that when we seek first his kingdom and surrender everything to him, what he does as he gives all of it back to us, minus our worry and our fear. He says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He says, if you trust in me and you put me first, not only will you have a, a simpler and less anxious life, but you'll actually receive all of what you're striving for, but not by your striving, but because of my gracious hand. You know, a little personal story here, and, and I hope that you don't hear me saying I'm so great and wonderful, but it is something from my past. And this is before I went into ministry. I, I was in a pretty good corporate job for my age, uh, excelling and climbing the corporate ladder. And then one day, Rochelle and I made the decision to leave that all behind us and to do what we're talking about today, and that's just to seek first God's kingdom, to stop the striving and the manipulating and trying to control our lives and to just let God drive. And it wasn't until years later that I looked back and I realized all the places that ministry had taken me around the world and all the people that I've met and all the opportunities that we had as a family and all the experiences that my children were given. Now, could that have happened if I had gone a different path? I'll never know for certain because I did as Yogi Berra said, you know, he said, if you see a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> I did. I took the fork. I went down one path. So I can't say for sure what would have happened if I'd have gone down the other path. But I'm pretty sure no amount of striving or conniving or manipulation or control in our lives could have given us the blessings that we enjoy today. And I bet you can say the same too, right? 
I truly believe that when anyone trusts what Jesus says, and in this case he's saying to seek first his kingdom, that what feels like a sacrifice to you at the time ultimately unfolds as God blessing you with all these things that have been added and given to you as well. It really is true. You just cannot outgive God. And what God really wants to relieve you of is your burden and your worry. But it's a continual process. Each day gives you an opportunity to either devote yourself to God or to devote yourself to worry. Jesus said in verse 34, and this is where we'll wrap up today, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. He's saying, tomorrow is going to come, and it's going to be another opportunity for you to worry. Because worry is a choice. Tomorrow, you will again have a choice whether to worry and put your devotion on the things of this world or whether to live in faith and peace, trusting in God and seeking his kingdom first. So you don't need to have a crystal ball to know that tomorrow we'll have trouble. But you also don't need to have a crystal ball to know that you have a heavenly father who knows about tomorrow. And you have a heavenly father that knows what you need and he cares about you. So don't worry about tomorrow. I mean, you can worry about tomorrow. It's your choice, but don't. Don't be like the pagans because you have faith. So let your faith cause you to put your trust in God and to seek first his kingdom. So for your homework, try this. Make a list, sit down, actually get out a pen and paper and write down all the areas of your life that you have concern about. You don't have to be particularly worried about them now, just all the things that matter to you and are important to you. Then you can hold them in your hand and read this passage from Matthew chapter 6 and then say, God, I know what happens when I look at all these things. I, I worry because I want certainty. I want to control what happens in these areas. But God, I'm letting you have this. I'm going to trust you with all of this. I'm saying, thy will be done. I, I have my goals and my dreams for all of this, but thy will be be done. Friends, that's called surrender. And Jesus is offering us in this passage an invitation to surrender all that, all that you have to your Father in heaven. But I've said this before and I really mean it. Whatever you offer to God in faith, he will never let be done in vain. I don't know how he does it, but he always takes that mustard seed of faith and he multiplies it, and he does more with it than you ever could. Jesus knows you don't conquer worry by trying to conquer worry, but you conquer worry by surrendering your life to God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what we've talked about today is something that's easier to say than to do. We have so many opportunities to worry. Some are in our imagination, but many are real. And Lord, we thank you that in today's scripture, you remind us that you know what's going on in our life and in our world. Just like you know what the birds of the air and the flowers of the field need, you know our concerns, our worries, and our fears. You know what we need. So help us, Father, to trust you and give us the wisdom and the courage to put into action the things that Jesus is teaching us. And I pray that for many of us, this will be an opportunity to surrender to you all of those things in our lives that have our devotion and our worry. And that in these and in all things, we would simply pray, thy will be done. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So friends, as we prepare to receive our offerings today, I pray that you would experience faith rather than fear and trust rather than worry, and that we would be reminded that as Jesus taught, we can't serve two masters because we will either be devoted to one and then despise the other. So that would, that would cause us to bring our gifts and our offerings to the Lord today out of devotion to him rather than devotion to our things, and that we would be seeking first his kingdom, and we would surrender to him along with our gifts all of our concerns and fears. So as we sing, if you choose, you can make your offerings through the links on our church website or through rbts.online.church, or you can mail in your offering. 
So may this next song remind us that this world is only temporary, but our Lord's kingdom is forever. Let's sing. Amen. And now let us together profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, let us join our hearts in prayer. Lord, just as those disciples on the road to Emmaus, our hearts have burned in us as we've heard your word today. Keep our faith strong and grant us receptive hearts that our hearing becomes believing and our believing needs, means steadfast faith and hope all our days. And Lord, we ask that you would bless your church, that we would, be, would welcome the stranger in Christ's name and manifest the unity of the faith in bonds of love. Lord, guard our nation, that we might enjoy peace and security in the face of threat and danger. We ask you to bless our president, our Congress, our governor, and all state and local officials, that they may fulfill their offices faithfully. And we ask that you would bless the military and all law enforcement, as well as all medical personnel who serve and protect us. And Lord, teach the nations the ways of peace. Deliver us from all our afflictions, and grant us strength to bear all our burdens. O oh Lord, hear us in particular today as we pray for Lyle, that he would get good test results and healing. Also for BJ and her continued improvement. We pray for Pat, who's been recently diagnosed with cancer and is beginning treatment. We pray for Carla's neighbor, Vicki, undergoing chemo. 
for Angie's father, Rex, for Mary's brother, David, on dialysis, for Stevie, the little two-and-a-half-year-old girl that has an inoperable brain tumor, we pray for her family. We pray also for Jennifer's cousin, Jackie, who was diagnosed with COVID-19 in Flagstaff. We pray for all hospital workers, for Gwen's mom and Colby's brother and his wife, for Mallory and Megan, all those who work on the front lines to take care of the sickest among us. And Lord, we pray for those who grieve. We join our hearts with the Johnson, the Comstock, and the Dundershaw families as they mourn. And Father, we lift up all those who have asked for our prayers and those that we have in our hearts. According to your gracious will, heal the sick, relieve those who suffer, comfort the grieving, and give peace to the dying. And Lord, we pray that you would stay with us and be our strength and weakness and our hope in times of despair. Your gracious will once kept the saints in faith even unto death. Keep us, we pray, with them in our faith and fear that we may be found faithful when Christ comes again in his glory to bring fulfillment to all things. For into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. We trust in your love and mercy through your Son, Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, it's truly been good to be here with you today. I pray that our time together has been helpful for you. And remember, we'd love to get a connection card from you. So if you haven't filled that out, please see the links for that. And you can also find a link for sermon notes and offerings as well. And please help your kids experience Sunday school this week. All you have to do is click on that kids link or visit the children's ministry page at redeemerbythesea.org. And in second, your kids will be seeing Miss Rhonda and our Sunday school teachers singing songs and learning Bible stories. There's even some printable activities that they can do at home. It's a lot of fun. And next Sunday, we'll conclude our Why Worry message series, looking at one of God's Old Testament prophets who really had to put into practice all that we've been talking about these last two weeks. So I hope you'll join us. So now as we conclude our service today, my prayer for you is that you would choose to set your devotion on Jesus rather than on your worries, and that you would seek first the kingdom of God and simply trust God with everything else. Amen? And who do you know that's struggling with worry. Why not tell them about the one who takes care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, but cares even more for them? So now to strengthen you for your life and witness, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
This concludes our service, but we're going to stay online for a few minutes for chatting and prayer. I don't know how long we're going to be meeting like this, but as long as we are, I'll look forward to seeing you here. Have a wonderful, safe, and healthy week. And don't let the enemy or the worries of this world steal your joy. But instead, walk confidently in faith, trusting in our God, who is powerful over even the grave. See you next time. God bless.